it's time for us to recap our workflow um, or hack flow. Um, so in Ubuntu, you've got what's called workspaces, which is kind of like having different desktops, similar to the way spaces works on a Mac. And the way you navigate through these is by holding down Control Alt and then using your arrow keys. Now I've got this set up with four workspaces by default, but you can have as many or as few as you wanted to. Um, but I, I like working with four. And in this first workspace, I usually open up the source code to the codec or codecs that I'm going to be hacking. In the second workspace, I open up a terminal to compile that source code. So remember, um, in order to do compiling, we need to be in the right directory. So type in cd space ffmpeg and enter. In this, then in this workspace, I open up another terminal, um, this, this one to run our videos through our glitch codec. Then in this last workspace I open up a glitch, the glitch home folder, um, which is where our videos are going to show up so we can open them up and watch them. Um, so this is probably a good time to mention that anything you do, any codecs you hack or videos you make um, on this DVD isn't going to get saved once you reboot. Or turn off your computer um, because everything you're doing right now is just sort of being stored in RAM so if you do anything that you like it's probably a good idea to back it up to a hard drive or a USB stick or something um, also don't forget what I said about the glitch being something that happens as a result of the missing coded file and the media player so if you're getting a glitch that you particularly like it's it's gonna be a good idea to record that to sort of document that which is why I've included a program on here called record my desktop and what this program is going to do is allow you to sort of screen capture any videos that you've got um, and make a sort of stable video file out of it, um, as opposed to these corrupted video files that we're running right now. So this stable file is going to be kind of like a document of your glitch that then you can open up in other computers, burn on a DVD, upload to the internet. Um, but it won't really be the glitch. It's just sort of a sort of document or stabilized version of this particular glitch. So let's go ahead and, and run through that process. First, make a change to the source code of a codec and save it. Then compile your new source code. And then when that's done, go ahead and run a video through your newly compiled glitch codec. So while that video compresses, there's one more important point that we need to cover um, about the nature of digital files, which is really similar to the nature of ideas. Um, there's this great Thomas Jefferson quote that gets referenced a lot in these situations where he talks about the nature of ideas. And he says that the nature of ideas is such that no one possesses the less because every other possesses the whole of it. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. And this is also true about digital files, right? So um, in economics, when a good is limited or scarce by nature, it's known as a rivalrous good. 
And this means first that my use or consumption of a good prevents others from using or consuming that good. And second, that in order to produce an additional unit of that good, we need to use up some sort of uh, limited social resource that we could otherwise use to make something else. So say, for example, a chair. If I'm sitting on a chair, nobody else can sit on that chair. And if we want to produce an additional chair, we need to use um, wood and nails, which we would otherwise use to make something else, like a desk or a table. Now, the cost of producing that additional unit is known as the marginal cost. So a non-rivalrous good is something whose marginal cost is zero. So, for example, ideas or information. Um, also, digital files are non-rivalrous, right? Because we can infinitely copy digital files at no cost. Additionally, my use or consumption of a digital file doesn't prevent anybody else from using or consuming that, that digital file, right? So economically, we understand that when we place the price of a non-rivalrous good above its marginal cost of zero, we create an inefficient market. And this is exactly what the proprietary commercial software model, which we mentioned before, does. It attempts to impose a sort of unnatural scarcity on digital software. Um, and once we know this, we can understand piracy to mean the refusal to comply with the industry's forced scarcity agenda. And this agenda just doesn't stop with software. It's also imposed on video files and music files um, and any kind of digital file via licensing and copyright. Um, so this is why um, we're starting to see a sort of backlash against copyright um, known as the copy left um, and also what I like to call the copy middle. Um, and the copy middle are those who sort of propose alternatives to copyright. So say, for example, Creative Commons, which works within copyright law to allow uh, for certain creative freedoms like appropriation and, and remixing for non-commercial uses. Um, the copy left are those who oppose copyright and intellectual property altogether, right? This notion that ideas can be a form of exclusive property, which, um, like Jefferson said, is, is just unnatural. Um, so because of the nature of this project, I'm putting this whole tutorial out there, uh, copy left, or uh, perhaps more appropriately, copy it right, which is, um, which is a sort of copy left uh, license or ethic established in the 1970s here in Chicago by video artists Phil Morton and Dan Sandine, from whom uh, this project takes a lot of influence and inspiration. Um, and so for that reason, I'm going to ask that anything that you do that comes out of the use of this tutorial, any videos you make or cool hacks that you come across, that you, that you share that and you put that back out there, copy left, um, by either emailing it to me or posting it as a comment on the blog or, or whatever. Um, but of course, given the nature of the copy left ideology, you don't have to do that if you don't want to, but it would be awesome if you did. Um, so let's watch that video. So the naturally occurring glitch is an unexpected and often perplexing event. Uh, this kind of intentional instigation of that occurrence can be called glitch art. Like I said before, glitch art can often establish this kind of healthy, critical relationship towards digital technologies um, that's granted and encouraged by the freedoms that are emphasized within certain spheres. But these freedoms, which are essential to this kind of critical relationship, is not only withheld, but it's hidden uh, and made illegal in other spheres. Glitching then can be a means to protest against these entities and their special interests, which deny us these freedoms. Glitching is a critique of the medium's structure, its material, and its politics. And the critical and intentional act of glitching demands this kind of freedom in order to be able to instigate, to explore, and to relate. Like I mentioned before, the glitches which occur by means of this tutorial exist as a result of two things. First, the misencoded file outputted from our hacked glitch codec, and second, the, the frame or the container used to view that file. So in this way, the glitch is uh, ephemeral. It exists somewhere in between those two points. And as technologies upgrade and error checking protocols hoard in, this particular kind of glitch might cease to exist. 
Uh, and so this ephemeral nature can help us become aware of the complex and fragile digital dynamism at play today and the assumptions that we usually make to the contrary. This hack always exists in the present and never in the past because every use of the glitch codec necessitates a new destruction of the codec file at the code level, creation by destruction. The glitch codec tutorial itself can be discussed as glitch art, but it's important to note that this tutorial is something that's always experienced, not just observed. It's a process, not a product.